thought I would first play for you um, the Diabelli theme, which we'll all probably think is a very delightful theme. Uh, but we'll soon find out uh, Beethoven didn't think so. <laughs> composed a theme, which he then sent out to leading composers across the Austrian Empire, including <coughs> Beethoven, in order that they might write variations on his theme. All immediately accepted, except Beethoven, who, who responded with a loud but resonant silence, refusing to compose on this theme due to it being, quite frankly, banal. It is repetitive, uninspired, and just the first few bars. There are 11 C major staccato chords in a row. It was this overwhelming banality which caused Beethoven to ignore Diabelli's request and to even go so far as to call the scene a cobbler's path. But he eventually accepted and converted banality into brilliance, composing his 33 Diabelli variations. At first, one might be tempted to think that this version is to be about Beethoven as a composer. On the contrary, this oration is to be about Beethoven as a listener, for this is precisely the activity Beethoven is performing in this piece. But what does this paradoxical understanding of Beethoven mean? In what way are we to conceive this giant of a composer as a mere listener in his composition? Might I also add that he was deaf <laughs> Before outlining the contents and arguments of this oration, this question must first be answered. This description of Beethoven as a listener was first made by the 20th century literary theory
just as the reading of a modern text is not in receiving, knowing, or feeling that text, but in writing it anew. All right, what is this one? It's going to be very abstract for, for a while. <laughs> This mode requires the listener to cultivate a kind of informed appreciation of the musical, in which he or she is aware of the structures at play within the music, becoming a collaborator with the composer and the text within the composition, arrange the components, as well as participating in the construction of the meaning and communing with the text within the work, as well as the author of the work who himself <coughs> has become a component of the text itself. It is this sense of collaboration which allows the listener to transition from being a passive receiver of the music, someone who just merely hears things and lets it pass over him without paying close attention, to an active participant or to an active inscriber. But this is altogether abstract. Indeed, Bart does not spell out exactly what this would mean what this would look like, but he does direct our attention to Beethoven, and it is now up to us to discover the concrete manifestations of his practice. But before diving into the Diabelli variations, I would like to point out that while Bart is a musician, his so-called practice of operation relies in an analogous sense on concepts of literary theory, specifically the idea of text what does this mean for music? And turning to the 20th century philosopher, Theodore, philosopher of music, Theodore Adorno, we can transpose, so to speak, a few key ideas from Bart to music. In Adorno's book, The Philosophy of New Music, the philosopher makes an observation that before Beethoven, variation was but a superficial masking of the theme. But after Beethoven, Variation was liberated. Adorno writes of Beethoven's theme and variation, the meaning of this identity is reflected as non-identity. The initial material is fashioned so that holding it fast means at the same time transforming it. Being nothing in itself, it is the only possibility to behold. Fidelity to the demands of the theme requires radical transformation in all its elements. In this way, Adorno is asking us to think of the theme as not having a fixed identity, but as material for metamorphoses, as well as, as a participation in the perpetual metamorphoses of music as a whole. He goes on to say, Variation serves the production of universal, concrete, non-schismatic relationships. A variation is therefore not a whole self-contained work inspired by another whole self-contained work, the theme, but rather a part of the development of liberated musical structures, which like a string are woven freely across, across works with multiple collaborators comprising a musical text. To draw our attention back to Bart, I must point out that Bart throughout his works says that text is to be played like an instrument, but specifically like that of theme <coughs> variation. And it's with this in mind that we now turn to Beethoven's Diabelli variations. Without much difficulty, it can be seen that Beethoven has already assumed the position of the listener operator, in that the theme is not his own, and his attentive close reading and appreciation or lack thereof, <laughs> is made apparent through the unfolding of this piece. I would like to focus on two techniques that Beethoven applies in his Diabelli variations, the first of which is play, which I want to talk about because it's kind of fun. <laughs> play involves an understanding of the rules of the game, in this case, uh, in this case, a musical piece, in order to arrange them rearrange them, uh, in order to arrange the components within the game in variations, drawing out their conclusions, making unseen connections and overlappings, or subverting the game itself and creating a new game 
based upon the pieces of the last game. In this way, irony is a kind of play. Perhaps the most blatant example of Beethoven's use of irony in this piece is the first variation. He, Beethoven proceeds by taunting the theme, <coughs> making it a grand opening, but a parody of grandeur. Turning the theme, turning the cobbler's patch of a theme into a heroic march. So I'm going to play a little bit of the, the, the waltz again real quick, the first of the theme, and I'm going to play the very, a little bit of the variation so you can just hear the similarities. <laughs> repeated static in all chords, uh, the same fourth and fifth intervals used at the beginning of phrases. Uh, this variation acts as a grand introduction to the college patch. <laughs> so this suggests that Beethoven's, uh, that this first variation is explicitly a parody and explicitly ironic. This is if Beethoven makes this variation stoof to the level of the theme for the sole purpose of ridiculing it. <laughs> Another instance of play is in Beethoven's treatment of the anacrusis. So what's an anacrusis? Um, if you listen to the very beginning of the, the waltz, it's this little cluster of notes just before the downbeat. That's the anacrusis. Um, yes. So, yes. Uh, so yeah, he, he has much fun shaping and reshaping this throughout the piece. In variation six, it becomes a trill, which is repeated in almost every measure. In variation, um, okay. in variation 16, it is elongated. And, but perhaps the most striking example of this is in variation nine, where it becomes the predominant constellation of notes throughout every bar. Let's play, let's play that real quick. It's only the increase. You see Beethoven selecting a gesture from the original theme and operating it, understanding the rules of the game and drawing out drawing it out to its conclusions. Might I also add that his use of irony is probably still a play here. For here we see Beethoven selecting a minor gesture that isn't even in the main body of Diabelli's theme, and then making it the most important thing in an entire variation. But in this variation, variation nine, Beethoven takes this gesture to an extreme breaking point. And it's a breaking point which I'd like to speak about next. Fracture would be the second technique. And indeed, it is a defining characteristic of Beethoven's late style. Adorno writes, This jure, however, the abrupt stops which characterize the late Beethoven more than any other feature are those moments of breaking free. The work falls silent, as it is deserted, turning its hollowness outwards. Only then is the next fragment added. But in what way does Beethoven operate this piece into the fracture? And what occurs after uncovering or framing this kind of generative silence that Adorno writes about? Well, the means by which Beethoven under, uncovers the fracture and the character of the fracture itself are reminiscent of Derrida's method of deconstruction. As Beethoven operates the theme by stripping it to its fundamental components and thereby proceeds to read closely in his variations, taking the components to their logical and creative consequences. So Derrida reveals deconstruction to be an activity, a process which, quote, operates necessarily from the inside, 
borrowing all strategic and economic resources of subversion from the old structure, borrowing them structurally, that is to say, without being able to isolate their elements or their atoms. The enterprise of what the person who has begun the same work in another area, the same spread today, and one should be able to formalize its rules. It must be noted, though, that Derrida's method of deconstruction, and he's clear about this, that deconstruction is not destruction, but a method which exposes cracks using the rules of the game, quote, designating, designating the crevice through which this yet unnameable glimmer beyond the closure can be glimpsed. In this way, it seems to take on a, a mystical or metaphysical character. But more on this later. Beethoven's fraction of the theme, therefore, then takes on a positive connotation. It is an inscribing, an evoking, an inscribing of what is evoked. There is much fracture throughout this piece. You see Barth's teacher and scholar, Andre Bukarechli, that draw our attention to this, his 1963 study of the Diabelli variations. He does this by referring to an unexpected eight note ostinato, which appears in the third movement, fracturing the form of the theme. I mean, fracturing the form of the variation with its shocking appearance. But just as the beginning, it disappears back into the In a sense, last piano sonata, mm -hmm. the Pierman also revealed the Arietta influenced these variations. 
but also the Diabella theme and variations influence the Arietta Sonata. I will not go into exactly how this occurs here. Radical distancing from the theme, as well as the overlapping of musical text you see here. Should recall Beto, uh, uh, Adorno's, Adorno's reflections on theme and variation. That through this metamorphosis and the development of Diabelli's theme and of Beethoven's Arietta Sonata, we see that identity of the theme being reflected back as the non identity. And here's a, here's a glimpse of that uh, variation 29. <laughs> As the old theme falls silent under Beethoven's erasure, we see a certain kind of silence emerge. Here we see Beethoven uncovering the heart of music through this operation, creating a frame for a kind of generative silence in which the whole of music is present. We will call this silence the Urmusik, or primary music. It is the absence of sound, but the presence of all musical possibility. This is primary music. Music before inscription, conceptualization, playing, in short, secondary music. Secondary music is like a spotlight. It illuminates silence. But once the silence, or once the secondary music, once the spotlight has stopped shining, the secondary music is dissolved back into the primary. Therefore, secondary music is that which arises from silence and disappears back into silence. In this way, the Urmuzik is akin to Heidegger's Das Nicht, is that which underlies all music. And just as the slipping away of beings allows the Dasein to come into contact with that originary nothing, so too the secondary, mu the, the secondary music's return to the primary forms a certain relation between man and silence. And in the words of Heidegger, a secret alliance with the cheerfulness and gentleness of creative longing. Indeed, it is contact with the whole of music, present in its potentiality, but a compelling and creative silence. And the Estonian composer Arvo Perret speaks of silence. He speaks of the nothing from which God created the world. In entering into this nothing, one finds the position for entering into communion with that first silence. The first creative act arose from silence. Let there be light. And on the seventh day, there was stillness. Therefore, the first coming to be was as music, which arises from silence and disappears back into silence. But the contemporary Catholic composer, James Macmillan says, the umbilical cord between silence and music as the umbilical cord between heaven and earth. He speaks of a potent silence, a generative one, a reflection of that first great act. Yet this communion with the Ormuzi happens not abstractly, but concretely in the very body of the composer. Arvo Perret begins his speech at St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary by saying, the composer is a musical instrument and, at the same time, a performer on that instrument. Meaning it is the joining of the composer's instrument 
to that pregnant nothing from which God created the world, that his instrument begins to sound. He continues, God knits man in his mother's womb, slowly and wisely. Art should be born in a similar way. Arvo Pear recognizes that man is both body and soul, both <coughs> physical and non-physical, which is why it is fitting that music is a knitting with the soul. It is a weaving of the metaphysical potency of the Ormuzik to the actual reality of the composer's body. Therefore, the full unity of music is found in the form of a listener operator. His activity unifies the secondary music through the embodying of the amateur musician. With the unifies the secondary music with the preconceptual primary music in his concrete body. It's this embodying of the amateur musician, striving to unite oneself with that originary silence, that the fullness of music can be actualized in every man. And through this unification, perhaps we can catch a glimmer of that blinding luminescence, that inaudible music, which governs the dance of the heavens and all the other stars. Thank you. So basically, the the premise of that that work is um, that music practica. Is Bart, Bart is saying that we become all entirely way too passive in the way that we receive music instead. He's also kind of upset that a lot of the music being composed in contemporary music is so complex that it, it really can't be accessed by someone who is you know someone amateur. And so he, he wants to he wants to unite these things, and he says. Right, well, we need to move from being just passive to active um, in our uh, in the way we interact with music, right? So this can this can take several forms, I guess. Um, he, he kind of alludes to the fact that it could be something more like a mental exercise, where you understand through kind of cultivating an informed appreciation of the piece that you can understand the piece better, understand the parts of it, how they fit together. Um, how they work with one another, and then you yourself can
because of St. George, and the original life was pretty straightforward. There's the dragon, he comes, uh, he seems to symbolize sin uh, in some ways, but then some of the other versions really expand it. Some of the dragon becomes a, a addiction in some ways, where you feed him one sheep, then he wants another sheep, and then consuming, we're seeing, uh, suddenly we're uh, giving him our children, and goes on, and it, it's understanding the literary art or the musical art in reference to uh, you know, a mediocre uh, author or musician. So I guess, it, I'm wondering if, this, if you think that's true, should we read more mediocre books and, and listen to more mediocre uh, <laughs> amateur? I think that was the word. So, so this idea basically uh, explore lower forms of music, lower forms of art, in order to appreciate higher forms better? Mm -hmm. Come on, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, um, I think that the comparison is really good here. I think that's part of, the, I think that's, I mean, Booker actually, after I mentioned briefly, uh, says that that is basically why Beethoven chose um, this theme is because he thought that this this is a place for me to really showcase what I can do with music. You see what it something could be, and you see so much potential in that, and then he just literally like expounds upon every single little detail inside of that theme throughout the variations. Um, so I guess maybe yeah. I mean it, it, yeah. I don't know too much about jazz music, but our jazz standards generally pretty simple. Mm -hmm. They're pretty simple, and then the jazz musicians take over and they make variations, they improvise, and they create so much. I mean, Adorno writes that, and uh, has also written all throughout the uh, the Cambridge Companions of Beethoven. Now, his late style takes on a very improvisational uh, kind of element, and I think, it, and especially in this piece. It's, I warn you, they're not like practical music. Um, so, um, so, let me give a little word. Um, the brief version of the question is Is Beethoven a philosopher? Or, or am I making a category error if I follow you too far and think of it that way? But, but to set some context, one of the professors um, attended um, some lectures by Bart back in the 1970s. Um, and and there's this paradox, right, that these lectures were absolutely packed and he had to arrive an hour early to get a seat. Um, uh, an absolute rock star of a professor. Um, <laughs> um, and yet, this man's most famous words were saying that, you know, in order to understand the reader, the price of the presentation gets the author. Yes. Um, so, <laughs> and yet, the hit he wants, right? The ultimate social authority is not Is something similar going with Beethoven? You know, are the Diabelli variations kind of like the crime scene? But we have the author, Diabelli. Um, and after humiliating him in various ways, and <laughs> even pretending to be Mozart at one point, yeah, that's right. um, Beethoven um, finally erases his existence entirely, and then with well, Beethoven, of course. <laughs> um, um, it's, it's kind of paradoxical that the Beethoven is referred to us here as the ideal listener or leader is. Is now such as the author and we're all ready to worship it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, so yes. So since it, since I'm getting rid of this thing anyway, um, how how then do I do I respect his genius? Do I do I read him as, as a philosopher who's that he's great critically, or or, or or am I missing something? Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah. I think there are two ways you can look at this. You can look at this as Beethoven constantly commentating on what he thinks of Diabelli. Or you can look at it a little more um, objectively, not necessarily through the lens of Beethoven, but just in terms of what's happening inside the musical piece. I mean, we see, we see all the little elements, all the little elements of that theme just being, all their implications being drawn out. Seeing, seeing what all the little pieces can do, right? And 
in that way you can view it more objectively. You can say, here's music, and to getting back to kind of um, what Adorno was talking about, like this theme of variation, is, is kind of, the music is like a, in a sense, like the music never, there's a perpetual development of music happening here, and that you are participating in that perpetual development. Um, and so we see that, we see all the implications and the metamorphoses uh, of the theme in the variations. We don't need to look at it <coughs> necessarily. We can just see what's happening in the music itself. Um, so I, I guess it depends on if you're going to go with Bart and say, I, I don't want to look at this thing entirely through the lens of the author. I, I think that he, he really pushes for, um, you know, the, the death of the author. I, I would say, I, I think I would curb that and say, I don't think the author is entirely unimportant. Right, uh, you know, there's like a way in which they draw their attention to like critics who, once they discover what the author meant to do in a work, and that's that's it, and that's what the work means, and that's all. Right? Yeah, that seems to be a little bit of a shallow reading of it. There's so much more at play inside it, and the art now is no longer objective, but it's only seen through the eyes of this author. Right, so you're trying to source the source of an objectivity. Um, and, uh, and I think that I, I could see the, the, the author as being a component, a uh, part of the collaboration, um, something that you can't ignore when viewing uh, a work, but not the entirety of it. Um, so, I mean, that's how I would think about the Diabelli variation, basically. So these two ways, you can either look at it as just all Beethoven doing his thing, or you can see it as, and here is also, we see so much implications for music. So I don't think you you can choose which way you want to see it. Let's take questions from the phone. Dr. Grove. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, speaking on an absolutely majestic piece of music, uh, totally awesome. if I may, I'd like to make two quick comments and then a question. Okay. First comment, since I, I don't think you mentioned at the beginning, it might be amusing to the audience to know this, that uh, Diabelli uh, actually uh, solicited a variation from each of 33 known composers at the time. Beethoven, when he got around to submitting, submitted 33 variations. So <laughs> it's not just Diabelli that he was humiliating. But... <laughs> <laughs> Every other composer uh, at the time. <laughs> Secondly, uh, I just want to put in a brief plug for realist philosophy. Uh, <laughs> everything uh, interesting and, and profound that Adorno and uh, Derrida are suggesting uh, about, well, about the topics that you raised uh, can also be looked at, I want to suggest, in terms of a realist conception of act and potency with the potential in the theme being what is actualized throughout the variations. And that also allows us to recognize that there are accidental developments and then finally room for at least approaching the threshold of a substantial change in the music where it truly becomes transcendent. Just a way of thinking about it. Okay, my question, and if you can answer the first one quickly, I'll ask a second. Uh, you took us as far as variation 28. Uh, in terms of the, the complete fracture. Um, do you want to offer any comments on what's going on in the last five variations then? Mm -hmm. There's more fractures throughout these ones. Um, so it maintains a, the slower, more contemplative sound. I remember, let's see, it was 29, 30, and 32, 33, 33. can't remember exactly now. Those are all still taking the arietta as the, uh, the theme. Um, with a little sprinkles of the in there. Um, there is a fugue in the last ones, and you can see that's another big you know, fracture of form there, very, very blatant. Um, I also think it's interesting to go back to the idea of drawing out implications of music more than just what is contained in the theme. And we have the fugue, which I was talking with Professor Hodgson the other day, apparently went out of style when Bach was still writing them. And so he brings this fugue now way far into the future and then composes it again. 
um, further drawing house, further change in the neighborhood. And might be added that on, a, on an emotional level, those themes are all exploring a, a, a very transcendent yeah. level, right? Um, <clears throat> feud, Beethoven resorts repeatedly to feud, and his loftier moments and his last <coughs> works, resorting to trills, the hands wide apart on the keyboard, little Beethoven and Beethovenisms, you know, that he indulges when he's really trying to pierce the veil. Just, Okay, I'm going to throw away that question to you. All right. Uh, as you know, the work is often called, maybe not without irreverence, uh, the New Testament of piano music, the Old Testament being uh, Box 32 Goldberg variations. Uh, have you had an occasion to compare them much? Uh, I was listening to them right next to each other. Oh, cool. Um, I didn't, I didn't, I don't have the, I didn't have the squirt look at the, the gold so yeah let's do it yeah they are uh they're considered uh two of the greatest uh, demon variation you know of all time you always put right next to them, so yeah that'd be something fun to look at Ooh. please Thank you, Mr. Gettix. It's always great to hear you talk about the great composers. Thanks, Mr. Galbraith. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you described uh, listening and sort of the uh, recomposition of music, wherein, as Dr. Hodgkinson put it, uh, Beethoven takes Diabelli and replaces him with Beethoven. Uh, yeah. Do you think that extends beyond music to the entirety of art? Is all art appreciation? taking that work of art and putting oneself onto it, and thus in a way kind of destroying the art to replace it with oneself. <coughs> yeah, interesting. Um, yeah, is it a... Uh, Graham Greene talking about destruction of the kind of creation. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, I, I, think, I, think, I was thinking about this. Um, yeah, I guess you could think about this in light of uh, T.S. Eliot's essay, uh, the the uh, individual talent and uh, tradition. tradition and individual talent. That's yeah, thanks, Dr. Um, where he, he talks about uh, you know the, the artist cultivating the, the sort of historical sense. So he, he needs to understand all that came before in this tradition as if it was present in that one moment. But then when he creates his art, he doesn't just create a replica of it, right? Or just a just a total mirroring of what came before, because we wouldn't call that art, that'd just be a replica, right? Um, but then also create something new, but very much continuous with the past, <coughs> right? Um, I don't know if that helps with your question at all. Um, can you say more, actually? Yeah, I guess it seems that in in the act of seeing what could be there and expanding that outward, as Beethoven has done, um, in order to kind of replace it with his own theme, it takes that work from being a like an objective thing into a far more subjective thing. Um, and normally we, we'd like to steer away from ultimately very subjective interpretations of art, right? As in your example of reading it only through how yeah. we think the artist intended, right? right. Well, when, when Elliot talks about what good poetry is, or what, uh, what a good poet does in that same essay, he says that the, 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 the poet should not be projecting himself into the art.
his awareness of this nothing, right? And he describes as kind of this like, mystical fog. We're beginning to uh, engulf you, right? As beings are dissipating, right? And, and nothing is disappearing. It's kind of like limits, in a sense. It's like you begin to know zero as X approaches zero. You know, that's the way. It's kind of an imperfect analogy, but kind of, okay. kind of works. Um, yeah. And so, so similarly, like in, in music, as the music is disappearing into silence, um, I, I was thinking of those things as a sort of similar similar concept there. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Charlie. Um, thanks, Pete. Um, I kind of want to ask a follow-up question, I guess to Dr. Virginia, maybe even uh, John too. Um, and that is, whether an introduction to this, I guess, like encounter with silence is necessary through like a pair, like Spiegel and Spiegel or mm -hmm. Ferrellina, yeah. whether that type of introduction where like the last note kind of hangs on and then you're not sure if it's still ringing or silence that kind of like introduces you to the silence. Is that required um, for a good encounter with silence or could i just go to you know immaculate conception and sit in quiet adoration and just uh, throw myself right in uh to silence is it necessary yeah to do that maybe more uh, expedient to to silence? Silence? i think the i think the the incredible thing about what arvo parrot does in his music <coughs> is that he frames silence so he, he gives he, he gives silence a sort of dimension, so to speak, by kind of creating the music around it. It's kind of like Mozart when he says the music is between the notes, right? It's it's that he's framed silence, right? Uh, in at the beginning, I believe it's a tabla tabla rasa, uh, the yeah. first. You, you hear that really strong. Is it the tonic note? I can't remember. And then right after that, the next. Um, the next measure, there's a big GP in the same for grand pause. <laughs> Science, right? It's framed directly into the piece. Same, same thing in Spiegel and Spiegel. Mm -hmm. there's a, silence is completely framed. Um, so it's a way of encountering if you're not already aware of it. And I think uh, John Cage's uh, 4 3 3 or 4 minutes 33 seconds is a similar, he's trying to do a similar thing. And he's trying to firstly, he's trying, it's, it's a lesson in listening. He wants us to listen in that piece. It's to understand that there is, that there is like, first of all, like no such thing as true silence in this world. But second of all, to, to begin to cultivate that, that year. Um, so yeah, it, it would be, due to the fact that these are framing silence, it, it would be,